Okay, hello everyone. This is a video log, which we don't have a habit of doing on score attack, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, as this is mostly aimed at my Facebook, Twitter, friends, people, acquaintances. But I figured I might as well chronicle this entire journey, this entire hell I went through the past week. And for posterity's sake, and because I want to look at it one year from now and laugh or cry or whatever. I know you be the judge. So, um, the past month has been a living hell for me. I am not gonna go into details about what kind of hell, you know, like, out of respect for other people's privacy. Essentially, I have had people close to me be very close to passing away and I have had people I've known actually pass away um, I kind of like managed to ruin a few friendships um, my dog in my hometown died and the other dog is very close to dying and it's kind of all condensed into one little time period which kept you know, pressing me, and I'm, I generally have a high tolerance for bullshit. Um, I don't have a high tolerance for a bullshit downpour, as evidenced by past month. So anyway, that's kind of the backdrop. And last week, there was this Twitter giveaway on the game industry Twitter, and uh, the giveaway was phrased so that they, they were going to do an interview with Shinji Mikumi uh, on a conference the following week. Um, and they asked for, you know, questions for Shinji Mikumi, and the three best questions will would win a pass to said conference. And, you know, I didn't figure I'd win. I, I never do with these kind of things. And I just decided, I'm gonna just, you know, ask a question, just like, oh, why, if Mikumi was here, what would I ask him? And I just phrased the question as, hey, you know, since you did a great job refining punching with God Hand and refining shooting with Resident Evil and Vanquish, you know, what's the next game mechanic you'd like to do? And I thought it was a cool question, I didn't expect it to go through, and after 10 seconds after posting it, I completely forgot about the competition, it just went about whatever it was I was doing. So, fast forward to this Monday afternoon, I get a tweet from Game Industry, uh, GameIndustry.com's Twitter, and they said, hey, you, well, your question is one of the three questions at one. Congratulations, contact us for, contact us for details. And I ch then, then is when I decide to actually check out the conference in question because holy crap, I won. And then there's this lineup of, you know, Shinji Mikumi, uh, Suda51, um, the creator of Prince of Persia, Bioware Senior Rider, um, Vlambeer's Rami, uh, Steve from Fulbright, like a bunch of people that I kind of wanted to meet and I kind of wanted to hear on stage. Uh, and I was just looking at it and thinking, wow, this is a really cool lineup. Maybe, maybe I should go, even though I can't really afford it. Um, because, you know, end of the month. Um, and I also, because of previous issues I mentioned at the start of the video, I had extra expenses because of that. And plus, I kind of like, spend some money on Steam sales as well, so it was a bit uh, of a conundrum, a problem. So I figured, oh, okay, it's, it's this weekend, I can figure shit out, I can, you know, think like, oh, I, I can decide in a few days where I really want to go, where I'm able to go. So that was Monday afternoon. Monday evening, um, I get home, like I'm home. I'm still thinking. Oh, what do I do? Do I go? Don't take go. Can I? I can't really afford it. Can I maybe, you know, get by, uh, cutting some corners, asking a few favors, stuff like that. Uh, and I'm talking to GD Geisha Deconstruct, who's my partner in crime on this channel. And she says, you know, you're not, you're gonna regret it if you don't go. And I just think to myself, yeah, yeah, I I'm actually gonna regret it if I don't go, and not just because I missed. A great opportunity to meet great people and see great people and hear great people uh, but also because of all the shit that's been going on the last thing I needed was a situation where I get something and then 
that something goes to waste. Like, hey, here's your free entrance to this awesome conference you'd love to go to. Oh, wait, you can't actually go. <laughs> oh, well. You know, that will just, like, be another pile of shit on an otherwise an, an infinite pile of shit. And that was another reason why, why I would regret it. And so I'm looking at hostel prices, stuff like that, and then on the website for Game Lab, there's, there's like, the, like at the bottom of the registration email, there's like, oh, here's, here's our suggestion for some hostels via the service, and I'm checking it out. And I click on the hostel. Oh, this might work. Let's see if I can like how much reservations would cost and all that. Why is it defaulting to the wrong date all the time? Wait, it's. It's not defaulting to the wrong date. Uh, my date was wrong. It's not actually this weekend, it's this Wednesday. So it's Monday, 11 p.m. Um, the conference is on Wednesday morning. Um, my only possible flight is on Tuesday evening. At that point, I'm just like, nope. That's not gonna happen, you know. I, I I cannot plan a trip for two days. That is fucking impossible. Who can, who plans? I don't travel that that much. I hate, I hate the process of traveling. I I like the end result of traveling. I hate the process of traveling, which I assume everybody hates, or most people do. Like I cannot do this. Like there's there's no fucking way I can do this. And after a bit, I just figure, okay, fuck you. I'm doing this. You know, I'm I I I can skip on this. So, so, I call in a few favors Tuesday morning, I order, uh, I reserve the plane tickets and then I need to pick them up from the travel agent, or travel agency, whatever, um, and you know, I go off for work, I, get, I ask to get off work earlier, I ask for like three free days, or I use my vacation days for those three days, and then... I go to a travel agency and uh, I walk in and I say, hey, hi, like I have reservations for a flight. And they're like, oh yeah, cool, give us your name. And I say, okay, Mirko Kovacevic. And they start, oh yeah, here we are. And they start listing wrong dates and wrong destinations and my heart skips. And I'm like, Ex excuse me, but that that's completely wrong. That is not what I reserved. Oh? But it says Mr. Kovacevic, and I'm like, uh, I mean, I like here's my passport stuff. Oh, this is a different Mr. Kovacevic. Sorry, let's check it out. Like, oof, oof. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine. It's super. Your reservations got canceled. What? What? But he, they, they expired. I, I, I reserved the tickets five hours ago. How could they have expired? Oh, that's hot. That 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 shouldn't happen. Yeah, it shouldn't. Um, and <laughs> she tries to. Oh, she says, "Oh, we just we'll reserve them again. It's fine. There are still free tickets. Don't worry." And I'm like, "Yeah, great. It's denying me reservations. What? I, yeah, I'm 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 trying to reserve them, and the computer just won't allow me. It won't let me." And I'm there for 10 minutes, my heart is skipping, and I'm just thinking to myself, no, why did you even try Mirak? Like, ah, you expected something good, huh? You're not getting it. Not today. And 10 minutes of that stuff not working, and then the travel agent, who was a wonderful person, says, hey, let me try something, I have an idea. And she, instead of reserving a ticket from Belgrade to Barcelona, she actually reserves uh, tickets, uh, she reserves the same flights, but reserves them like individually since the flight was over at Zurich and then on the way back through Geneva she just like reserves them individually, like indiv for individual tickets rather than, you know, um, one big ticket. And it works, it works, and the price is still the same, and I'm like, wow, thank you. And then she yells, oh my god, there's a problem, and I'm like, what? Um, you, you, you can't carry like cargo luggage, you can only carry hand luggage. Oh, that's fine, I, I, I. I wanted only a backpack. It's fine. Don't worry. Oh, and that's cool. Congratulations. Uh, your flight's like tonight. You have to be at 6 p.m. and that'll oh, great. Now it's 2 p.m. I'm like, no, I'll, I'll manage. It's it's super. Thank you. Thank you. I get home. I pack super fast. Um, and I pack also my final print copy of my book that I own. 
at the moment, um, which will be relevant later. But I decided, yeah, I, it might be a good idea to, you know, just like if I had a, like my own game, I'd bring my own game. I might, I might as well bring my own Ryan there. Why not? So I pack stuff, and I look through the bus, uh, the buses that go through Belgrade, since I'm in Novi Sad, and Belgrade is the one with the airport, so I have to get to Belgrade. I'll check like the buses because going by train, going by train is absolutely unreliable. It's like the most unreliable thing you can do. You should never um, go via train in Serbia if you need to be somewhere very fast. So I get a bus that goes by a freeway, has only one stop until Belgrade, and uh, gets there in 80 minutes, 85 minutes. That was like the approximate time it took. Uh, which is, you know, the best, that's the best variant you can get on, on like, the you Novi know, Sad and Belgrade line. So I got to bus stop. The bus is, like, 10 minutes. I'm panicking, like, what the hell? Where, where's this bus? What's going on? And the bus finally appears. And thinking that there might be a problem, I asked the driver, Hey, um... Hey, uh, when do you figure we'll be in Belgrade? And he says, oh man, look, and this is like the Serbian phrase of it. In Serbian he says, autobus malo kvarutska. Now, kvarutska is a variant of the word, it's malfunctioning. But the way he phrases it is, the closest the thing I can, like, say in English is, Oh, it's kind of malfunctioning-ishingly-esque. You know, that's like the most like drawn out variant of, hey, it's 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 not working properly. So so when do you fear we'll actually be there if there are problems? Uh, and yeah, five thirty at best. Uh, it, I I what? And. You know, just like for reference, I should, like, that's 5.30 at best at the bus station. I have to get from the bus station, which is, which is close to central, central Belgrade, to uh, the fucking airport, which is in the outskirts. And I'm just, like, sitting there and thinking, like, holy shit, what now? And the bus arrives for 20 minutes, then breaks down for 5 then drives for 20, then breaks down for 10, then drives for 20, then breaks down again. And we're going for a three-way, which is the only good thing about all of this. And we reach the first stop, which is halfway to Belgrade. And the bus driver says, well, that's all, folks. It's, it's dead. The bus is dead. What? Yeah, it's not going anywhere. Okay, um, is there anything that will... You know, is there like a replacement bus? Oh yeah, don't worry, there's a replacement bus. It'll be here in around 15 minutes. But just so you know, it goes through the old roads. You know, not the freeway, and it stops everywhere. And it's full. So when, so while well, it'll be in Belgrade, like when? Oh, like 6.37, but that's better than not getting there, right? Like, I have a plane to catch. Like, I have a plane to catch. Oh! Well, I don't know. Okay, um, like, uh, I have no idea what this place is. I know it only by name. I don't know where I am. Um, is there a taxi stop here? Or something? Oh, you, yeah, there are taxis over there, but like, they're expensive, man. Like, you know how much it costs to get to the airport? Yeah, it costs less than I fucking paid my plane ticket. You fucking assholes, I'm never driving with you again. So I go, uh, I go stop a cab and just ask him, like, look, how long does it take, how long do you feel it'll take you to get to, um, the airport? And he says, like, three minutes. I'm like, good, I'll take it, let's go, let's fucking go. And I tell my friend, uh, Damien, who was supposed to wait for me by car, with, uh, his car at the bus stop, take me to the airport, I didn't call him and tell him, hey, listen, this and this happened. So then he needs to like get together with someone else I was supposed to meet so I could get uh, part of the money I needed for the trip. So he so now Damien has to go get it. And then when he gets, he has to go to the airport and he has to wait for me at the airport. And so like, ah, uh, and I'm doing all these rearrangements. And then when we're like at the exit for the freeway, which just so you know, because the bus was left the freeway, 
like we 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 were on the freeway like five minutes before the taxi started, and like we get to the exit on the freeway, which was right there, and there's a cop, and the cop isn't letting anyone pass, and the taxi driver asks, "Hey, uh, man, like what's going on? Like nobody can pass? Nope." But like this guy's hurrying on the airport, and we're like, nope, nobody passes. Keep going. But what? Keep going. So we keep going, and he's like, don't worry, man. The taxi drivers are like, he he was really cool. He was really cool about the whole situation. Like, oh, don't worry. Um, we'll just go to the next exit. Next exit also has a cop blocking it. We're like, what? Well, we're gonna have to go through the old roads and then go through the exit near, on the freeway near uh, the airport. You know, that's our only option right now. I'm like, yeah, okay, sure, man, whatever. And he, and the, of course, since the freeway is closed, all the old roads, which are shit, are full of an insufferable amount of traffic. Uh, and I don't generally condone, uh, like, rash driving, but I am kind of like, I was at that point, I was like, dude, Use your judgment, do whatever, I don't care. <laughs> um, and we got to get to the third exit, and that's blocked off too. We're like a, like a kilometer away from the airport, and that's blocked off too. And then we realize that the entire fucking freeway from Belgrade to Novi Sad is closed off because uh, a Chinese official is landing on the airport and he needs to get to Novi Sad. So for his safety, they have absolutely blocked off the only fucking freeway we had. And I'm just like sitting there and like the politician passes and we somehow get there like in the nick of fucking time. Um, I'm gonna get on the plane. And you know the plane ride was fine. Uh, my phone, sorry. The vibration should have been off. Okay, now it's off. Um, so the flight was, you know, kind of fine. Aside from like this um, German slash Austrian slash Swiss woman, I couldn't tell. I, I do speak German, but like there was this woman saying next to me who whenever someone in the plane sneezed or coughed, she would violently... Uh, like swear them like just like random swears like god damn you and stuff like that but she was kind of talking it like to herself so only she and well only she and like the immediate people around her could actually hear it but she kind of got the impression she was uh, like surrounded by diseased foreigners and just like ranted off until later in, in the flight she started coughing and sneezing as well and then she just shut the fuck up Anyway, uh, I arrive at Zurich, I have a, um, I have like 7 hours from 11 a, from 11 p.m. to like 6 a.m. until I can get on a flight, and I say, oh, like, cool, it has like airport ho hotels, I can sleep there, nope, nope, it's like 120 uh, Swiss francs a night, which is like roughly 120 euros for a night, which is insane, that the cheap variant was... Uh, paying to sleep on a couch the couch was 40 50 euros so I just like packed all my things in my backpack used my backpack as a pillow and then slept in the Wi-Fi zone and just made a range and arrange like I'm, I'm very paranoid about being pickpocketed all the time uh, so um, I kind of like arranged it so that the opening of the backpack was facing a wall and that my arm was going through like a belt on uh, the backpack so like that if somebody pulls it nobody can get it, and stuff like that and I woke up with the worst fucking back pain in my entire life but that's okay I mean we all suffer for our dreams and um yeah, and then like I got to Barcelona, and then I get to the hostel first uh, to check in, and the hostel guy says, "Hey, your reservations aren't good." And I'm like, "What now? Just like, just what? What happened now?" He said, well, "Because the entire site was in Spanish, and I was using Google Translate to figure it out." He says, "Oh well, you you reserved this for a women's room, and you're a guy," and. I really 
thought about giving a certain answer, but at that point I was just, I'm too tired. Uh, and I'm like, like, look, can, do you have anything else? Like anything? Oh, we have, we have, we have like, a, a space. I'm like, oh, thank God. But, what, what, but what? Well, you, you ordered a six, uh, six like bed room and this is a four bed room, so it's more expensive. And then I'm just like, my head is going through, oh god, it's gonna be like twice as expensive or some shit like that. And he said like, no, no, it's like, uh, it's 25 euros. And the other price I had before that was like 22 euros per night. I'm like, oh, super, I take it. Okay, can I leave my stuff? Like, no, you can't. Uh, why not? Well, check-in is at 12, so you have to wait until 12 noon to check-in. So you can wait there. Uh, but but I, I, I have a conference. Oh! Well, can you come back from it at 12? No? No? Oh! Can I come back, you know, tonight? Yeah! Cool! And then I go with my backpack to... Um... To the conference. With my, like, big, unwieldy backpack. I don't know, fucking full conference, but it doesn't matter. It was like... Oh yeah, I asked like ask like the reception guy like do you know where this hotel is where the conference is and he has like oh I I know it's famous but I have no idea where it is. So I asked people on um like people I met like on the road like hey do you know where this thing is I know it's kind of nearby. Um and Spanish people have an incredible talent of being good at explaining things despite even if they don't know English. So I had like this woman who didn't speak a word of English. Uh, I just showed her the address of the place I wanted to go to. Through gesture, she managed to perfectly describe where I needed to go. It was amazing. I love you people. You're the great. You're the best. Um, and just like in general, just like to know that Spanish people are really nice. I didn't have the misfortune of meeting any Spanish person while I was there who wasn't nice. That was like so fucking refreshing. Um. And I got to the conference, signed up, figured, oh, I'm gonna leave my backpack here, they probably have something like a place where people can leave, you know, their jackets and stuff, nobody did, so I had to, like, carry my backpack, whatever. And at this point, the conference actually starts, so here we are 20 fucking three minutes in the video, and I still haven't actually started talking about the conference. Uh, let me just get my notes here. So I'm just gonna go, go through the whole presentation and just say how it actually was, because it was amazing. Um, so like doors open, network and Hindi hub games exhibition. Um, so actually let's, let's just like talk about the indies a bit. So I'll, I'll, like there was this indie exhibition room, um, and a lot of like people both from Spain and outside of Spain were displaying their games. And I'm just gonna like re re reiterate my experience from Casual Connect and that indies are fucking amazing. Um, they had there were so many good ideas and there were people who were open to feedback, like I, I like talk to a person, like ask them, okay, how far are you developing, how much can I be open to, like, feedback, you know, I ask them how much feedback do you actually want, um, and they were all like, yeah, literally, like, if you don't like anything, tell me, and I explained it to them, and they're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense, and of course, like, whenever you give someone design advice, you always have to, put, like, give them a disclaimer, like, look, I'm probably, I might not be actually right, I'm just telling you, like, how, what, I experience like it's up to you to figure out where to listen to my advice or do something else you know just like it's your game and that was super cool um the fun part is <laughs> this happens on every fucking co every conference i go to um i sit down at the game and apparently a lot of like people who are bad at games play these games on exhibition and they kind of like approach me oh this is gonna be like super hard let me explain it to you oh you're already playing me oh you're you've gone farther than anyone else so far and actually managed I managed to be the first person to beat it in like two or three games, I think. But like, th those people are super great. Um, like, even like... I don't know, like, it, it's just, a, it's just you know, indie artists, uh, indie designers, they're really open to discussion, they're super friendly. Um, like, even the games uh, that like I didn't like, they had a particular charm, like, that I didn't like because of taste. And games I didn't like because of quality, you could like talk to them, like, hey, how, let's like talk about what maybe you can fix, you know, like, you know, I want everyone to make fantastic games as they can. So that was great. That was fantastic. Um, great job, Spain. And 
you you have a lovely indie scene and i only hope that uh, other countries follow you in that regard and have some, just as amazing indie scenes so uh the first actual thing was like at the start of the day there was like an interview uh called more indie awesomeness i'm not sure who did it um it was about it was an interview uh, f- uh with the people who made um steamworks uh dig uh or steam world dig i think it's steam world dig i'm sorry if i misremember that it was tesla grad uh there was the next penelope and i was kind of confused because i didn't know that the next penelope was already out and i kind of wanted to play that and uh the guy from Hipster Whale who did, who did like uh, Crossy Road, and that was like really cool. They talked. Like, I really liked the interview. The interviewer, uh, who uh, he who obviously played all those games and then like talked more about them rather than just like looking at screenshots and thinking what to say. Um, after that, uh, looking for blue oceans in the mobile games market, I skipped that one. Um, I, I'm just gonna be honest. I came here for the design meetings, and after casual connect, I kind of want to cool down on marketing and business. And honestly, um, when you're on these conferences, you can't listen to all lectures. Um, I think it's better to skip lectures you think aren't necessary for you, rather than going to all lectures and limiting the amount of information and attention you can get. Um, the Shadow and the Flame Facing Our Dark Side in Video Games and in Life by Jason Mechner, or Mechner, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, I'm really sorry. Um, that's by the creator, wait, is it Jason or Jordan? Jordan Mechner. Um, that's the creator of Prince of Persia and Karateka. And, man, that was, like, that was just what I needed. I think that was the, that was probably my best, my favorite, uh, session. It talked essentially about uh, the development of Prince of the first Prince of Persia and Karateka, and it combined that with this uh, idea of fighting one's own shadow, which I'm guessing is familiar to people who studied psychology or who played Persona Four. Um, you know, just like like this, ne- these negative emotions you have that are kind of like self-destructive and kind of how to fight them. But essentially, it's like the survival guide for okay how do you make a game and not break not crack under the pressure and that was really good it was really emotional uh jordan as a brilliant man i had the opportunity to talk to him like on a different day after that for 15 minutes um it was just like he was probably the most one of the most amazing people to talk to then because he sounds so successful and extremely down to earth uh, that's that's a combination I, I almost never witness like personally uh, lessons learned while growing that was from Zaptolab that I skipped sorry uh, the void of journey to mixed reality I was thinking of skipping this one but um, this is essentially uh, by the people who are doing the void which is this theme park styled uh, VR thing uh, you probably saw a trailer it was it was interesting because I was really curious about how the games games that are going to be used for the void are actually designed in terms of you know length format you know, because because on arcades like, I drew the most parallel with the with arcades like it's like arcades is easy you lose a life you lose a coin uh, and then you walk away from the machine but here because you have like this kind of big setup like you have, like you know all the weapons and uh, vests and the goggles and all that stuff and you know if you kind of like do all that walk into a room and die and it's like yep your turn's over that kind of shit and they kind of touched upon that they didn't explicitly talk about it but they mentioned enough details that you could get a picture so that was that was pretty interesting uh oh this uh two paths to innovation chris crawford from uh, chris crawford um so chris crawford is a ye olden veteran uh, from the Atari days, and he is working on a game which I do not want to butcher. So I am actually going to open Twitter and check this. It has an odd name, uh, but let's see. There we go. Seaboot. It's on Kickstarter right now, actually. Um, 
this was really interesting. Um, because this was obviously like, I'm not gonna say it's like a plug for his game, Kickstarter, because everybody's plugging everything, uh, but it's, it's about his game as well, but he talked at first without making it about his game. Uh, so there's this idea that games, um, games kind of um, emphasize and capitalize on different abilities that humans have. So, you know, shooting games and platformers are reflexes, coordination, and stuff like that. And we have all these, like, kind of aspects of our brain that um, games challenge, uh, but we don't have an actual game that challenges, like, social interaction. As in, there are games with social systems, but they aren't games that challenge uh, social intelligence because they do not ha offer enough uh social responses so like you have bioware games where you have like choices but those are very defined choices and you have responses which, which go by design and contradict each other in the sense of you make someone upset and then you go to them and they don't act upset anymore that kind of stuff um and essentially what they want to do with Seabut and the engine he's been developing for 20 something years like i mean like not yeah, like actual. I, I know if it's actual program. But I know he's been trying to figure out how to do it for twenty years. Um, the idea about it is much like how you have a way uh, to adjust your physics in the game, in the sense of this is how a bullet flies, this is how jumping works, this is how debris falls, you know, stuff like that. That you have a kind of framework which can. Uh, based on the parameters you parameters you enter and kind of rationalize social behavior much in the same way and he is i don't know if Seabert is that thing uh, in the sense of can that can it achieve it but i do think that he is right in the way that yes we don't have such a system because it's fucking insanely hard to do it but you know check it out um i i think it, there was it was a very there was a very good takeaway point and i think like kind of like part of his intention was you know, even if you think that this thing can't do it, think about something that can do it. Because it's a big problem, you know, it's easier to mimic uh, physics and that's not a job at people who, you know, focus on making good physics and ripple effects and water. But it's kind of like easier to do that than make rational social behavior because you have to take into account different cultures, different like, you know, it actually goes as far as you know having relationships established between certain NPCs, and it's not like you know a plug and play you know thing like you plug the social system into Mass Effect and all of a sudden Mass Effect is better. It's it's kind of its own genre. It's interactive storytelling as he called it, but it, it is a very good point. I mean, we have so many games about shooting, and there's always this depressing sentence I once heard from. Uh, one of Tom Francis's tutorials, which which was, well, we have shooting, so now it's a real game, uh, which was joking, but it was so fucking depressing, and yeah, this kind of works for it. I I, I think that was a very good presentation. I really enjoyed it, and that was both sponsored drinks and shit, so we can skip to the next day. Uh, let's see, how many games can level up education to the twenty first uh, century? Uh, so that was like uh, Forbes contributor, Robio guy, and CEO of what we, what we want to know. Um, that was okay. Um, it's it's really hard, hard to talk because like the general takeaway is, you know, how can we make education not shit? And um, well, the general like you know uh, premise was how can we make education not shit? But since since it was in like an, an interview format. Um, the takeaway ended up being uh, what can we as game designers do to help teachers in the classroom uh, to make their lives easier because honestly teachers nowhere, no, Serbia Western Europe, uh, US doesn't matter, teachers don't have an easy time and aren't nearly as held in the regard they should be held um so that was like that those were like useful questions without obviously like nobody gave a solution but I'll, i hope people are inspired enough to come to their own solutions which is also you know if you get like that kind of takeaway uh from conferences that's amazing that's great uh i was 
like the only other conferences I went to uh, was Casual Connect Belgrade, and I watched conferences online, like on GDC uh, and stuff like that on YouTube. Um, it's better to have like this kind of takeaway of asking the right questions that might inspire an answer than some of the shit I've seen, which was like, uh, it's, it's usually I work in free to play in mobile, but this usually happens in free to play mobile. It's oh, we are super successful with this game. How did we do it? Um, we made a good game, and then all good things happened. It's like no fucking shit. <laughs> it's like yeah, you you literally said nothing. Um, and I don't know if that's because people in free-to-play mobile space don't know yet what they're doing, or if people are keeping their cards close to their chest, or both. I'm not sure, but in general, that's kind of a trend. I don't like it. This game, Games Lab, thankfully, didn't fall to that trend, because all things were amazing. And let's get back to the schedule. Um, storytelling, storytelling is a tool for making open-world games. Uh, so that was from... In all, in, uh, in all irony, I'm gonna like mispronounce the last name. It was by Conrad Tomaskevich. Tomaskevich? It's, it's Serbian Polish aren't that similar. Um, anyway, it was starting as a tool for making open world games. Uh, it was kind of like just like it was by the creative director of The Witcher 3. Today we're talking about uh, the kind of methods they use to fill up the world, make it interesting. A lot of stuff was familiar because it was already talked about in pre-release material um, and in interviews, but it was good to hear it like this and have an opportunity to ask a few questions. And obvious and Conrad was a good presenter; he did cover a lot of stuff. And I think in general that was kind of that, that was pretty good. Ooh, and now we got through the first like interesting bit. First interesting, everything was interesting. Like the first odd bit, it was the interview with uh, Suda51, which was called Grasshopping from Punk to Business. And I don't know if I underestimate uh, the popularity of Suda, or if he is like insanely popular in Spain, because holy crap, he is like a rock star there. Um, or punk star. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I apologize for that. Uh, anyway, that was good. Like, he, he is a pretty chill person. I haven't played too many Suda51 games, I admit, because they were kind of on platforms I didn't have access to. Uh, I played Shadows of the Damned. That was, that was pretty good. He talked about, like, the way he develops things, um, his kind of, like, philosophy and approach to stuff. He does, like, making sequels. And it's kind of interesting, like, hearing because his uh, games are all held in very high regard like creative wise and like the messaging they have and all that stuff but he kind of mentioned how uh they usually talk to a publisher to see what the publisher wants and then they kind of form an idea around that and you know it's pretty it's pretty cool he is a super friendly person i sadly he is one of two people i didn't have a chance to like properly talk to because it was funny uh, so many people were swarming him to get autographs get their games signed get a photo with him and all that time, his translator and the event organizers who were like organizing, I guess, TV interviews as well, were kind of like grabbing him, like, hey, hey, we have to go, we have to go. And he's all like, yeah, sure. And then he turns around and uh, meets with another fan because he is super thankful for, you know, like, like his fans. And it was super fun. It's like, I, I, did, I only got a chance to like shake his hand and say, him, tell him thank you for the games and stuff like that. That was like, five seconds but you know his presence like really really inspires people that, that was that was great um let's see oh yeah game lab 2015 on reward ceremony and on stage interview with the master of horror shinji mikami so this is the other reason well this is kind of the reason i came for in two ways like the thing that got me the ticket and the thing that kind of motivated me uh because uh shinji mikami is uh, together with Daisuke Ishiwatari, my favorite uh, game developer ever of all time, and and you know like I, it was like it was an interesting interview. Uh, it was done by Dan Pearson of uh, GameIndustry.biz. He is the guy who chose my answer, and <laughs> it's funny because. Uh, Japanese developers are really, really fiddly with their answers. Like, they just give you enough of an answer, but they're really short because they're careful about what they'll say. Two good things during that interview is he answered my question with that he'd like to make a game with world building, which I think is super. Uh, and 
2, he said that he would love to do a God Hand 2 as an RPG, and that just... Being the, one of the first people who heard that in the world is amazing. Because I then saw like Twitter like flare up 10 minutes later, like, oh, Mikami actually said that! And I was like, yeah, and, and I heard it first. But yeah, um, after that, obviously like, there were autographs and uh, with Mikami, and here's the part where I picked that Chekhov's Gone, which is my book, which I mentioned far, far earlier. So I, in the meantime, I was like, I was thinking really hard what I want to do with that book. I was thinking just like bringing it and like, you know, showing it to people uh, in case they ask what to do since I'm both a game designer and an author. And I figured, you know what? Mikami, you know, he made some of my favorite games of all time and games I enjoyed. Like, that there is not a Mikami game I did not actually enjoy in some way. Uh, I figured, you know what? I'm not gonna get an autograph. I'm not gonna take a photo. I'm not interested in that. Uh, and honestly, I'm really. I, I am not like an autograph photo type of person. Um, and I figured, you know what? I'm gonna write a handwritten dedication. And I'm gonna give it to Mikumi and just tell him thank you for all the games. And I was waiting in line because they put him on a table and let him sign to make like things less chaotic. And I went there and just like used some of my broken Japanese knowledge from college and sounds just told him like, hey, I make games and I write and your games have been like an inspiration for me. Uh, well, and I told him like I came all the way from Serbia here because of him and I gave him the book, told him, hey, this is like a present for you. And then walked away because my heart was obviously ra racing and I was kind of starstruck and there were like, like, what, 20, 30, 50 people behind me which were getting all cranky. Um, so I went off, I saw while I was going away that he was still like looking at the book being like, oh, this looks pretty cool. And his translator was also like, oh, this looks pretty cool. And yeah, I, I, I felt warmth in my heart. I figured I'm never gonna speak to Mikami again. That was my moment. And then I went to the next one, which was uh, Narrative in Games, a challenge, where's the expectation by uh, the senior writer from Bioware, Corp David, and uh, that was a pretty Bioware uh, presentation, which I, I don't mean like a, like a bad thing. There, there was no actual dialogue wheel when we asked them our questions. I mean, more like they talked about Bioware design, Bioware games. He worked on the Dragon Age series. Uh, as the most recent thing. Um, that's kind of good because the, the presentation was very earnest, which you wouldn't really... Uh, well, I didn't really expect something as earnest for a, a company as big as Bioware uh, that works as a subsidiary of a publisher as big as EA. You, you, you don't expect earnesty. But there was... They were talking about the things they did right. They were talking about the things they do wrong. They were giving insight into how their, uh, like dialogue narrative choices are set up and what the end result should be. And for the bad things that they did, uh, he kind of explained this was our logic and what why we did this and this way, uh, and it backfired. But at least they give you the reasoning and then they tell you, well, I think the reasoning was wrong. Um, it was really good. I, I think it was like really effective. It was a very, um, like, you know, like when you're talking about narrative, a lot of people tend to go very in very abstract thought. Like they talk about like as an art, but there is also a part of writing, a very practical part of writing, which kind of goes into the craft part, which is what people who actually go to college, to, as far as screenwriting goes, you know, learn they learn the craft of writing, not the the art of writing. Well, they are, learn both, but you know what I mean. And in that regard, it was a good uh, presentation. I managed to talk to him a bit uh, later in the day. Um, he was pretty cool to talk to. Uh, I just like asked a bit around, like you know how development in Canada goes, how the like development Bioware goes, and stuff like that. So it was, he was a pretty like cool person. Let's see what else do we have. Uh, oh yeah, there was like. Uh, Industry Legend Award Ceremony and Onstage Interview about Game Development uh, Training with the Greater of Pac-Man Professor Toro Iwatani. Uh, that's one I walked out of because um, all the other presentations were in English and then if you couldn't speak English you had a translator put back in a radio you could listen to. This was the first one which was the reverse. So it was in Spanish the entire interview. 
And then uh, you have a translation booth, which explains everything in English. And I just couldn't wrap my head around it. It was close to the end of the day. It was like 5.30. I was tired. Uh, like, no jab at the actual quality of the translation. But when I noticed that a lot of the talk there uh, was stuff I already read about, I just figured, okay, you know, I, I'm, I'm just taking up air and oxygen here in space. I might as well just head out. So I did. And then we have the third day. So the third day was interesting. Oh, and so I can't like I, I stayed a bit later on to on the on the previous day, um, and I came back to my hostel pretty late. Now the thing is because it's a ho like the hostel, you can kind of say like it's a bad hostel because it costs twenty five euros for a bed. Like that's kind of like keeping your that's like being an I don't know, uh, McDonald's, and saying man I expected more from this food. You know, it's, it's not like that. So, uh, the thing was that the bed was very squeaky, uncomfortable. It, it, it was the quality of a very... Uh, of a below average student dorm. Which in Serbia's case means an average student dorm. It was kind of like the place, uh, people from Serbia will know this, where we send our elementary uh, school students uh, on excursions. And when we make where we make them sleep, that's kind of the quality we're talking about. Like it's pretty shit. Uh, so anyway, my devices were all drained, and I used that like hostel only for sleeping and showering. Uh, and I didn't want. I had like a cabinet with a key where I put all my valuables, uh, but because I shared my room with strangers and because technically anybody could walk in walk in at night. Um, I didn't want to just like leave my devices out in the open um, and risk it. So my my phone was almost dead. My iPad was dead. So I figured, okay, I have a plan. I'll just go the next day, earlier in the morning, and uh, go to the hotel where the conference is. And they have this big table in the lobby with uh, power sockets. And I'll just charge myself there. Uh, you know, an hour of charge should be enough to take me through the day. And I do that, you know, I, I get up much earlier than I thought I would, and then I went there. And in front of the hotel, there was no one, except for uh, Shinji Mikumi, who was out for a smoke. And you know, like, and, and like the worst part, like on the side there, I saw his the award he got the previous day, and under the award was my book. And I'm like... Damn it, do I do this? Like, do, do I actually approach him and nag him? Because, like, it's early morning. Nobody likes to be bothered in early morning, and he went out for a smoke, expecting to see nobody, probably. And I just figured, like, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm never getting this opportunity again in my life. You know, that's just how it is. So I approach him, I start talking in broken English, tell him, hey, I'm the guy who gave you the book yesterday and all that. And then I reach the limits of, like, what, wait, did I say broken English? I'm in broken Japanese. I talked to him in broken Japanese, and then I realized I reached my limits um, of Japanese, and I can't relay my thoughts anymore. And then he says, you know, English is fine too, because he can understand English, obviously, which I completely forgot at that moment, but obviously he can understand English, he just, you know, doesn't speak English uh, too much. And I was like, oh, okay, and then just went into English and just like, you know, Show them off, like, hey, this is a game I'm making. Hey, I like like your games. Hey, God Hand inspired me, and like, hey, when we were making this game, you know, I was looking to make the game feel good, and your like standards for game feel were my reference. At that point, you know, I want the game to feel good and all that. And I nagged him there for probably ten minutes. I was pretty starstruck. And then I was like, when I was done, I was like, okay, I won't, I won't nag you anymore because by then he was also done with his like cigarette. And I just like told him like, like oh bye thank you again for all the games I hope you enjoy the book, and then he like he 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 gave me a thumbs up he smiled, and said, make good games. And uh, that like that that almost brought me to tears at that moment so I kind of like had to like hurry up and kind of get away. Uh, because it was like it was it was full on anime and dramatic, uh, 
but it was very earnest. Like like Shinji Mikami, uh, Suda said that on his interview that Mikami is a real joker and he likes likes he laughs a lot. But holy crap, he has a fucking earnest smile if I've ever seen one. And that kind of like that that meant a lot. I think that was kind of the the high point for me uh, when that happened, and you know that was the part where the entire trip made it worse. The entire hell I went through, you know, the uncomfy beds, the stress, the eating only sandwiches and coffee uh, during the conference uh, and pastry during the evenings because that's how much money I had with me. You know, all that, all that crap I went through, yeah, that was worth, that That was the point where I said, yeah, yeah, I guess I'll make good games, you know, I, I made a promise that I will now, now, now I don't have a choice, I guess. So, yeah. Um, uh, I met up with Dan Pearson that day too, thankfully. Uh, just just like thank him for the ticket and all the grief he summoned up for me. <laughs> now uh, it's not his fault, but we talked a bit about you know Serbian game development, uh, about like East and West in the sense of you know Eastern Europe and Western Europe and US, not like East West in terms of Japan and everything else. We gotta talk about that, uh, the rollout thing. I realized like very early in the discussion that that's something it's not really talked about. Like like the social social media uh, and general media in the it, like in gaming is very West Europe, West US oriented, and there's very little talk about like the rest of the Western world, like Eastern Europe, Central Europe, Russia. Areas like that, areas that they don't, don't like, aren't in Asia. There's very little talk about that. Uh, there's very little insight about that. And yet we're, like, all very so close in the sense of, like, we always communicate. But it's kind of like, you know, standards of this side and standards of this side. And it kind of, like, get culture clashes in the open. And we, we talked about a lot of stuff. And that was pretty cool. Um, I hope, like, next time he gets a chance to talk to an Eastern European developer, he'll keep that in mind because... I, I feel like we we need more communication in the games industry in general. Anyway, uh, how video games will destroy humanity and how we can save it by Tom Jubert, narrative designer of the Talos Principle and the Swapper and Penumbra. Um, this was good. Uh, it was an exercise on how to essentially create your own setting. And it's not like, sorry, it's not like, um, oh, you need this race, and you need this race, and then you need this ecosystem. It's not that kind of world building. It's kind of like narrative world building. And you take premises, and you build upon them. You build upon current trends, and then you create a setting. Like, you know, base, you can create like a, high, like a cyberpunk setting based on current trends by taking them too far. There will be a video of it. You should check it out. Uh, it gets very philosophical at some points, but obviously because he solid philosophy uh, and his games show that as well but it's good it, it's, it's it's it was useful and help it, you know it helps me for my stuff so like almost all all the stuff I've been to has been super helpful um let's see the fantastic reality virtual play skip that don't want to play indie games sorry uh wrong by Rami Ismail um that was, that was also good. That was about common misconceptions uh, and wrong approaches in the video game industry. And it's not, it wasn't, you know, stuff that, like, preaching, oh, like, they are doing, like, mobiles being wrong right now, where you, when you usually see uh, indie developers talk. It was more about well, what everybody's doing wrong, what everybody's bad at. And that's kind of good to talk to because then you can at least avoid the most common mistakes. Um, I didn't get a chance to, like, properly talk to Rami, I wanted to talk to him, and he, he did want to talk to me, but kind of circumstances ended up so that he left before we could, but he was pretty cool, um, he is super friendly, he is super tall, um, and he offered kindly, like, oh, we can catch up on Skype instead, which is pretty awesome, Lambert makes really cool games, uh, they're making Nuclear Throne right now, please, be you know, check that out, it's a game I really like. But yeah, um, actually, like, I'm just gonna say, like, all of these are gonna be on YouTube, 
uh, sooner or later, so you can all watch them. Obviously, it's better to be there in person, because then you're more active, more thinking about what questions you can ask, more thinking about what you're taking in, your sense impressions, but video is the next best thing, so go for that. Uh, survival, horror, inspiration, and belief, music on screen, alien isolation, uh, I didn't go to that one, sadly. Uh, pushing yourself out of your creative comfort zone, that was from Steve uh, from Fulbright. Uh, that was talking about Gone Home and their new game Tacoma, and it was also super useful, because then they talked about, you know, how to make something new, uh, and how to use things you already know and that's something new. Um, it was also very useful. Uh, I, matched, I I chatted with him for like two minutes, like Steve is super, super nice, super chill. Um, and yeah, um, you should also, if, like, uh, there's a lot of narrative stuff here, there's a lot of design stuff here, and it's all just like, I can't really say much aside from that it's useful, um, and what it's like about. But I guess like if you hear anything here that sounds interesting to you, just, you know, check it out on YouTube when it's up. Uh, and yeah, the closing thing was the art of war for girls, how to end up being the person you actually are. Uh, this was by Whitney Hills, who is a game designer who worked on Fable 2 uh, and a few more games. Uh, this was uh, about, like, it's called the art of war for girls, but it was essentially a survival guide for everyone. It's how to deal with, you know, day-to-day you know, uncomfortableness, stigma, um, not okay behavior from other people, stuff like that. Very useful uh, for anyone, and I'm glad that there was uh, a female presenter there. And I think um, a lot of the female developers there were also happy because the mo- like this was a session with the best uh, audience questions and answers because the audience was really engaged after this. And I'm so, so glad it wasn't the snarky type of engage because there was that shit on Casual Connect uh, where someone asked uh, a female presenter who was talking about narrative uh, or other copy editing in games. Um, and someone asked her how many games she plays. And it's like, seriously, dude. Like, fucking seriously. I'm glad there was any snark here. There was snark behind me that I could audibly hear like people being people but oh well like nobody was being a public idiot <sighs> and that was a good that was a good presentation it was useful um and had a lot of focus like tai chi apparently helped her a lot with day-to-day stress so hey maybe that's worth looking into the next time i'm about to crack and yeah after that that was like the closing thing um, I spent another night, woke up at 5 a.m., went back home. I didn't get to see much of Barcelona uh, because time constraints, money constraints, constraints, constraints. What I did see of it is the pastry is fucking amazing. Holy crap. I did ruin, I did ruin my stomach uh, because I was exclusively on a diet of mini sandwiches, coffee, and pastry. But, oh, well, I, I've been through worse. Uh, I've been a student, after all. And it's very safe. Like, it, it feels... I don't know how safe it actually is at night, but the night I went through, it was, like, midnight. And you could see people walking with their children in the evenings. You know, there wasn't any discomfort. And that's kind of my my metric about how much I like a city, as uh, how comfortable I feel walking through it at night. For example, uh, Belgrade, I feel super okay walking through at night. Novi Sad, nope, not, not, not in a million years. Um, I don't know, Athens, I didn't like Athens at all because of the way it is at night. Um, Min, München, München, uh, Munich, I'm, I'm trying to remember all the variant names of it, sorry. Uh, that was pretty crap at night. Uh, Cologne. Uh, or Kuhn, that was super cool at night. You know, that's kind of, kind of stuff. Like, that's kind of like my metric and my experience with cities. But yeah, um, despite all the stress, this has been super worth it. I have met people I never thought I would. I have talked to people I never thought I would have. Um, I, I'm i thankful I went there. Um, thank you all, on all my friends online. I mean, 
both online and offline who kind of supported me keep telling me I believe in you you can do it and stuff like that because I really needed that like you on the way to Barcelona I just wanted to like throw my backpack like at the floor and just say I quit a few times over and I didn't and I'm glad I didn't and I feel much better like coming back home uh, last night was the first time I actually slept properly in more than a month like I haven't been sleeping I haven't gotten any proper sleep in the past month at all and this was the first night I finally feel kind of like mentally at peace so you know thank you all people I met there thank you all people I didn't meet there for just being there and enriching the environment with your presence and stuff like that and I'll try going there next year and not go on a two-day notice I will never go anywhere else on a two-day notice <laughs> Or, or maybe I will, I don't know. I probably will. I'll just then whine about it on Twitter. Bye.